Hey everybody, thanks for joining us here today. This is Nicole with Topaz, and today I'm so happy to welcome Miss Joanne Carries for Blending Reality and Fantasy, Creative Illustrations with Topaz. Let me tell you a little bit about Joanne first, and then I'll go ahead and give the presentation over to her. So Joanne is the award-winning author and illustrator of Sun Believable, connecting children with science and nature. It's a children's picture book for young readers. Joanne has always loved children's literature and recently began writing stories for her grandchildren. Her professional career took her into the health sciences field, where as faculty at the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and Robert Wood Johnson Medical Center, she merged her love of storytelling with research and technical writing skills. Recognizing for both storytelling and illustrating, Joanne now teaches others how to create extraordinary illustrations like you see here today that transform digital art into award-winning masterpieces. Her original photographs from New England to Siberia set the stage for her unique digital art, which has earned seven national awards in 2012 alone, including the coveted Mom's Choice Gold and Indie Excellence Awards. Her new children's book, I Want Cake, will be released late 2012 along with a breakthrough customizable book app version of Sun Believable, the book you saw here today. So with that, I will go ahead and turn this over to Joanne. What I want to do in today's webinar is walk you through the steps that I use to create an illustration such as this one. And as I do that, I want to cover three key points. One is to focus on the illustration style, which is the blending of fantasy and reality that creates that magical, visual, powerful impact. And the workflow, the steps that I use to create the overall image on a set of layers in Photoshop. And of course, the Topaz filters which <laughs> I have to say really is where for me the fun begins to ha happen and the magic occurs. So if we take a look at a couple of quick examples, again we're looking at a folder where I've collected some images to show you and they're being displayed here in Photoshop Bridge. So here's an illustration that I did very early on when I knew almost nothing about Photoshop nor about filters. But I wanted to take a photograph of one of my grandchildren and create a storybook for her. So I took a photograph of her and some common everyday objects uh, in my environment and I started playing because I quite honestly didn't know what else to do uh, except to blend together some digitally manipulated elements so that I could achieve color and texture and perspective that began to emerge as something very different and unique from the sum or the whole of the parts put together. And then when I started illustrating my first book, Sun Believable, I used that same technique. So real people, fence, flowers, etc. But I needed a magical sun, which again, I manipulated in Photoshop so that it became personified since it plays a big role in the story. Another illustration from Sun Believable, just to show you the kind of edgy look that I started being able to move quickly towards. A real tree, uh, lots of shapes and curves and textures, and especially love this house. And let's take a look at this photograph of the actual house and see what was done in Photoshop with my wonderful teammate, Frank Thompson, who is an artist and knew a lot more about Photoshop at the time than I did, and was able to use Photoshop techniques to produce that wonderful, magical house that's very appealing in children's books, or quite honestly, in almost any type 
of image where you're looking for a real wow. And in this last example, again, uh, real objects, little girl, a fence, and a personified sun that sits on its sun porch and hangs its rays out to dry after a bath. And she delights in the drips of the sun falling on her. And again, you can see the texture that I've created in the background against the clouds. So that should give you some idea of where I end up with my illustrations. But with that, let's go back to the very beginning. What you're looking at here is the template provided by my wonderful book designer at TLC Graphics. And this is what I now use to create my illustrations. So I'm going to open it in Photoshop by right-clicking on my mouse and selecting Photoshop. And you can see I'm working in Photoshop CS 6. But it doesn't matter. You can use almost any version of Photoshop. Uh, I have it rather enlarged, so let me take it down just a little bit so you can see the whole image. Now, you can start with just a blank page, so to speak. There's nothing here. And when I first started, this was my beginning point. Now I have a template or a construct within which I can begin to build an image. And each page has its own layout and design. And so here, just quickly, you can see I have text on the left. And this dark area in gray is the area that I'm going to fill in with the illustrations. Let me just click on a few different layers and get to the one that shows just the blank illustration field that I'm going to use to place all of my background and images and elements. So that's where we will focus today. So what do we need to do uh, for filling in this blank space? Well, I'm going to go back to Bridge and, and take a look at this photograph with you. This is a garden. I took this photograph and honestly, I'm not a terrific photographer. You can see there's not a whole lot going on except I needed a garden scene to set the stage for the storyline in which the girls uh, who are the main characters, are on a very serious quest. When they wake up in the morning, they want cake for breakfast. So they wander around the neighborhood and they pass a garden. Well, that garden is fairly mediocre at best. So I'm going to need to do something very quickly with that to make it come alive for a storybook. And if you'll bear with me, I've lined things up here uh, for the sake of demonstration so that I can take this photograph, and I'm grabbing it in the center, and dragging it into the center, or anywhere really, in this empty frame. And there you have it. Well, we have a couple of problems for starters. First of all, it doesn't quite fit into, uh, as you can see when I move it around with my cursor, it's going over the edge. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on the technical aspect of this, but do want to emphasize that, of course, we have to have the image fit inside the border. And those of you who know, um, how to use the keyboard for transform. I'm just going to use Command T and uh, on the Mac or Shift T and I'm going to just grab the nodes of the transformed photograph so that it fits in and I can move it further along. Well, I still have a problem. 
uh, in fact, several problems. And one is that the photograph is still quite dull. And it's not going to produce the type of, you know, wow effect that I have envisioned for the book itself. So I took a couple of shortcuts today. And please feel free to ask any questions about how I do this. But I wanted to be able to show you the panorama that I created from that photograph. And that's simply using some tools within Photoshop that allowed me to merge the two layers together and blend them into this panorama. And this is the layer highlighted on the right where that layer is active. Now, I'm not happy at all with the dullness of this. So the very first thing that I want to do is right click, choose duplicate. And there are many ways to duplicate. But let's use this one for today. Click OK. And we do this because I'm about to apply the first um, topaz filter. And I want to keep this layer intact and preserve it. So I'm working only on this active layer and going up to my menu bar, choosing filter, topaz, and adjust. Five is the menu that I want to work with. So here we have a user-friendly interface that I have a lot of fun with. And those of you are, who are familiar with it know that on the left, we have a number of presets that can transform a photograph immediately. And you can see the effects, which I'll demonstrate in just a second. And on the right are a set of additional adjustments that you know, you can spend hours. I, I do. I, I play a lot to get the effects that I like. And I have to say, too, that once I've become familiar with the Topaz filter process, the importance for me is in creating illustrations is that it doesn't just speed things up. I'm not looking for speed as much as efficiency in the workflow. And that's, that's the beauty of, for me anyway, of using the filters. So all right, let's take a look at what some options exist for us to transform this photograph. Here's the before, dull. And Topaz generally defaults to the settings that were used previously when it was open. So it has defaulted to a setting which has pretty much brought out the richness of some of the color. But I'd like to do just for purposes of uh, illustrating technique is take a look at some other options. Mild contrast pop doesn't quite do it for me. Exposure correction is one we might use on a photograph that needs some work. And here's one, Painting Venice, that is lovely but doesn't give me the effect that I have more or less envisioned for my photograph. So one of my very favorites exists here in the Adjust for Preset list. And that one is called color pop. We can do mild color pop. Mm, that's OK. But um, even simple photo pop doesn't quite do it. So let me choose color blast, and you'll immediately see something happen. We have brought out the richness of the ground. Now, I like the brown. It's very vibrant. I want to go over here to my global adjustments and maybe bump up the color just a bit. So I've chosen in the color tab 
the hue. And this slider, as you can see, if I bring it all the way over to the left, it's going to produce far too much red and the other end of the color spectrum far too much green. So I'm bringing it back to the center and that's where we started. But I want to just bring out a little more brown. You know this is all very subjective and what strikes you at the moment. And remember you can always come back and make further adjustments. So up here at the top left we can look at before and compare the after. Well, I'm pretty happy with that because it's a whole lot better than where I started. So I'm going to come down here to the bottom right and click OK and let it process. And it's going to show up now in my frame as, yes, there we go. Good. And that is on this layer that shows Topaz adjust because it's a smart filter. I don't want to get into the technical aspects of that. However, I do want to point out that as you create your own set of layers, it's really important to label those layers. So let's just go ahead and do that now as an example. So I'm going to say that this is the Topaz adjust, color blast, whoops, color blast adjustment. So that I'll have in my history a way to retrace my steps and believe me, uh, there were many, many times in the past when I didn't do this and I was really sorry because there was no way that I could recreate what I had done. And the other point I want to make here while we're on this page is that when working with an illustration style template, there's this seam or gray bar. I'll make it a little bit darker so it's more visible. And the reason this is here is that it represents the center of the page or where the page is going to fold. So if we look at it here, we can see that, there we go, any object that I place in its way is going to be lost. So I'm going to be very careful with that as I now begin to add more elements to create interest in our illustration. All right, so we're back to here and I've been clicking through layers very very quickly. Uh, those of you who are familiar with layers know that it's the layers themselves that are like, like pages in a book. They stack one on top of the other or below depending on where you want to place an image. Well, now I need to add some characters and bring the characters into the illustration. So I'm going to head back to Bridge and find the photograph that I took of the main characters in the story and open them up in Photoshop. And when they open, I'm going to use the Topaz Adjust Filter because, again, uh, this is full daylight. I used my camera to point and shoot. The girls were posing for me because of the storyline where in the garden they asked the gardener for cake for breakfast and <laughs> the response is, sorry girls, I do not have cake to give you. And so uh, they run away because the gardener asked them to help with the worms and of course they don't want to do that. So off they go. Now. In order to apply the Topaz filter, I've selected the background or the native file and I've right clicked, duplicated the layer and now we have two layers sitting on top of the background which we're going to preserve and not make any changes to. But this is the layer 
called background copy that I'm going to highlight and now go back up to filter topaz and select topaz adjust and when the interface comes up it's going to use as I said the prior settings so we're going to turn those off by clicking before and it actually did make a few little adjustments in the color. It's a little bit more vibrant. So again, I could begin by playing and taking a look at what something like Specify does. And that's not the effect that I want to have, although it might be suitable for some other type of illustration. Clarity is nice because it brings out some detail on the skin, but it's a little bit too dark. And I would guess that if I went over here into the adjustments that I could probably make some specific adjustments that would bring out the color. But since I have my color blast option sitting right here, I'm going to click on that. And wow, that does make it pop. So let's look at before and after. Well, that brings out a lot of orange in the girl's skin, but I'm not so concerned about that right now. Let's take a look at what happens if we enlarge this and you see the graininess in the skin. That's something that I'm concerned about. So I could use very separately uh, take this photograph into Topaz Denoise and suppress the noise in the skin that way. And I have done that and I do that often. But instead, right here in the same interface, I have the option to suppress the noise. So I'm going to select under the Noise tab, Suppression, and just begin to slide it over to the right, just a tad. And you see what happens? Um, the, the noise begins to disappear. And it doesn't take a whole lot to achieve that effect. So I'm really happy with that. Let's zoom back out and see what that looks like. That's, that's much better. I'm really happy with that now. So I'm going to say OK. And instead of what I would ordinarily do, which would be to save this image. I've already saved it in Bridge because the next thing I need to do is extract the girls from the background. So I'm simply going to File, Close, and Go to Bridge and not save this. But remember that it's important to save if you are doing this on your own and building your layers as you go. So here is the, um, the extraction of the girls. And as you can see, I'm placing my cursor on it and I'm going to bring it over into the frame of the illustration. And now I can place them Remember, I'm not going to put them in the middle of the scene. And I'm going to put them just about there and see how that works. Uh, and the next person that I'm going to add is the gardener. And she's sitting back over here in Bridge. So let's bring her into Photoshop and apply the Photoshop filter. So. Here she is on the background in the native file, which I will duplicate like that and hide the layer below and duplicate this layer again. And that's the one we'll apply the filter to. So back up here to Topaz, adjust. And remember that the filter defaults to the prior setting. You can see that here, last use settings. And actually, I like that. Remember, it was the color blast. This was the before, and this is the after. 
And I like that. I like the way the color comes out of her dress. So I'm going to click OK. And once again, for the sake of time, I've already used a remass extraction process. So I'm going to close this and go back to Bridge and not save it because in Bridge, here is our gardener. I'm going to bring her over into the illustration and place her somewhere in the background and then use my Photoshop technique with command and whoops, I don't want to change her shape and just with the shift key being held down I'm going to make her a little bit small and place her in the background somewhere like that. Now this is the actual process that I use so I wanted to show you that you know this is one of the steps as I go sometimes illustration like this will take me a day and sometimes three days or three weeks depending on how many adjustments that I want to continue to make. Well if you know about the layers, now she's obviously got to be in behind the girl. So we're going to move her down and you see where she disappears behind the young ladies. So I'm just going to keep her there, but click on the girls and use my transform nodes and make them just a little bit smaller. So we have a couple of problems that I want to address really quickly. One is the fact that our poor gardener has no feet because when I extracted her, her legs were in the grass. And so we well, have to help her out. And the way that I decided to do that is um, a little bit of a trick that I've learned in illustrating. And that is that I can use an object that's pertinent to the story to create some illustration magic. So I'm bringing this can of worms, and this is the one you know that is essential to the storyline because the girls don't want to help with the worms; they're running away. And I'm resting it on this box so that it hides the gardener's <laughs> lack of feet. And the other thing that I can do to this can of worms layer is duplicate it. So I'm right clicking, duplicate, clicking OK, hiding the layer below, and going back up into Topaz to find a way to make this can of worms look more interesting. And again, it's defaulting to the last used settings. I really like specify sometimes to can see how dramatic the object becomes. And I should mention again that this is a photograph that I took so that there are no copyright issues. That's really important when you're building these types of illustrations. Well, I'm going to click OK. And you can see that you know those changes are made immediately in the photograph. But there's one other thing that's really bothering me for right now, and that's the sky. Because the scene takes place on a very bright, sunny morning, and this sky is just not going to do it. So I'm going to choose the layer where it is. That's over here. And I'm going to turn it off completely. And I'm going to go to my Layers panel and select Create New Layer, and you'll see this new layer appear here. And back over in Bridge, I'm now going to take an image of the landscape with the background of the garden scene where I've used Remask in Topaz to remove the sky because this is where I want to add real color and vibrance and that 
that wow factor. So now I can play in this space. And in order to do that, I'm going to create a layer that uh, will show behind the empty space. So down here to create layer. And with this, back into bridge, since I already have this set up. And for the sake of time, I'd, I'd like to do is bring in this. Let's look at the whole page. This is a page that I purchased from an online scrapbooking site. I like the colors, but they're very muted. So I took it into Topaz Adjust, and I did a color blast and just a lot of smoothing to get to this point. So let's see what happens when we bring it into the background of the sky. And all I need to do at this point is, with my shift key and finger on my mouse, move it over. Let's see if we can get rid of that little whatever it is in the sky. And OK, that's um, already a lot more colorful and interesting. And again, to get an idea, uh, I can turn off the black screen and frame it in. So uh, that's looking kind of nice, but I'm still not happy with the sky. So let me show you a couple of tricks real fast that we can use on the sky. And the first one is I'm creating a new layer. And I'm going to use back in bridge a Photoshop brush. Can't see it here, but watch what happens when I bring it into the sky and move it up like so. It becomes quite visible. I love the whimsy of this. This is a free Photoshop brush that I downloaded from a site called Brush Easy, so there are no copyright issues. You can actually create the, this type of brush directly in Photoshop, but look at the impact that that has on the scene. And I want to further pop it out by doing a, an adjustment such as this. I'm going to click on, double click on that layer. And that brings up the layer style menu. And go directly to the gradient overlay, which defaults to black to white. And we certainly don't want that in the sky unless a big storm is coming. Thank goodness it isn't. And I want to bring out some blue in the sky. So I have in my presets for gradients um, a blue range of colors that I think might work. So you see what happens? It automatically makes that white set of clouds blue. And then I can further refine it, you know, make it a little bit lighter. In fact, go directly onto the brush and move the gradient around. So one, one last adjustment to the sky. I'm going to add a layer above this one, new layer, and go back into bridge and bring another type of cloud into the background. You won't see it quite yet because it's not visible, but we're going to make it visible by repeating the same steps that we just used. And that is with the layer style. I'm going to click Gradient Overlay and click again. And you see the black to gray. Uh, I want something more yellow here that is going to pop out the yellow since this is the direction that the sun is coming from. So let's see if I can quickly find a strong yellow that I can work with. And it might be for now that we use 
of this one because I can see a lot of orange and I know I can play with that. And it's by moving my cursor around, you can see what happens. Ah, I found some yellow. Okay, I like that. So I'm going to leave it that way for now and take another look at the illustration here without the black screen around it. So if I were to stop just here, I'd still need to address the color of the border. And so let's do that real quickly to wrap things up. And I'm going to make sure I'm on the right layer, and that's this one, Layout Guide Copy. Go to my Adjustment Panel, click Hue Saturation, which brings out this flyout menu. And because I've played with this enough, and I, I ah, OK. <laughs> we'll have to clip this layer to the layer below, or this adjustment will affect every single layer below it. So this allows us to affect only the border layer. And I'm going to colorize it so that I can get a quick sense of what color range that I think might work. I kind of like something pastel, maybe a little bit yellow in that range, and then we'll hide the flyout menu. Okay, so uh, we've <laughs> we built an illustration. There are many other elements that I could bring into play here. Let me go back into Bridge and show you where we started, and that was up here. And you can see how I duplicated the can of worms, so I added a palm tree, and this colorful bird seat. And all of these elements have been adjusted using the Topaz filters. So we've used Topaz Adjust, Topaz Denoise, Topaz Remask Suppression, and those kinds of filters. Now, let me scroll all the way down to this final illustration, which is my actual working draft of the storybook page that uh, I'm working on. The story is called I Want Cake. They don't get their cake, and they're running away. So um, just to recap what we did today. We talked about the illustration style because uh, there's been a lot of interest in it since it's captured the attention of um, you know a lot of the, the major awards that are not accustomed to seeing illustrations like this in children's books. We went through a workflow process of building an image from scratch, and then we used the Topaz filters to make the image really interesting, whimsical, full of curiosity, detail, and imagination, which apparently both children and adults seem to love. So with that, I will hand it back over to Nicole and uh, see, see what, let's see what kinds of questions you all have. All right. Thank you so much. I love this final illustration. So Thanks. let's see here. Wendy had asked earlier that she saw that Digimark is on the picture of your grandchildren, and mm -hmm. she wanted to ask about the copyright process and, if, um, and about the Digimark. Okay. Well, Digimark is a paid copyright uh, code that I think uh, is really critical, uh, especially when uh, using photographs of children, uh, whether they're your grandchildren or not. So I always embed a Digimark code into my photographs that not only copyrights them, but then allows me to see, if I want, where the photographs are being used. and to track them if I ever needed to 
or wanted to. It's just another way of protecting them. Uh, the copyright is also in effect by virtue of the fact that the book itself and all of the images in it are copyrighted. So I hope that answers that question. Yes, thank you. We had several people as you were working and building more layers and layers on tops of layers. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we had several people ask if you know of the standard size that your final image kind of becomes in pixels and in megabytes. I thought that was ah. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I can um, I can answer that by doing this. Um, I'll talk it through. I'm going to open this. It might take a while to do it in Photoshop, but that's where the information probably okay. resides. So um, in as it opens in Photoshop, um, yeah, there it is. Good. Um, the, the size of the book that I'm creating is 10 inches by 10 inches. And let's take a look. Um, actually, this is in CMYK, not RGB color, in its final form. And for image size, so the width is 6,000 pixels by 3,000 and 20 inches wide, 10 inches high, with a resolution of 300. Does that answer the question? Yes. Um, I think also as you were okay. working in the layered file, it was just getting mm -hmm. really, really big. I saw, I think it was over 500 in, the, in that um, 500 megabytes. I don't know. Um, so I think that's what they were referring to, too. Do you keep your layered oh, okay. files as well just to refer back to? And do you know if those get to be like over a gigabyte pretty easily? <laughs> uh, very easily over a gigabyte. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. I would assume um, so, not, yeah. all, not always. Uh, some more so than others. Um, but I would say a little, uh, a little bit less than a gigabyte per layered um, or PSD layered file. So when I send these to my book designer, for example, in layers, they take a long time to Got transmit it. because of because of the the size of the files, yes. All right. I have a question. I don't see who asked it. I'm sorry. Uh, do you start with the script or the illustrations, or do you um, iterate as you develop both? Ah, well, that's a wonderful question. OK, so what I start with is a story. And my son is the storyteller of the family. Uh, though my background is technical writing, I find it very challenging to write children's stories. But um, he, he has a gift for storytelling. So I, re I rely on him to create the stories. And that's always the starting point. Because without a story, um, I, would, I would just simply be creating images and then trying to fit the images into a story. And that, that process just, I guess it could work, but it's a backwards approach. And I would advise you strongly not to do it that way. So start with a story, even if it's a draft, because you can always change the text. Uh, and make story edits. But why another important reason why it's critical to start with a story is because when you build the images, you want to create the story within the story. In other words, an illustration that's so powerful it almost speaks for itself. And you also want it to be a page turner. So take a look at this illustration, the girls are running away from something. And if you had no story text at all on the left, you, you might wonder, what are they running away from? And so I think, you know, just to recap, yes, the story first, and work on the story, and make it uh, rhythmic and interesting, so that when you begin the illustration process, you tune into that same rhythm, if that makes sense, and create the power of the illustration that 
goes along with the words. Great, thank you. Let's see here. We have a few people asking if you are formally trained as an artist illustrator. <laughs> mm. um, I'm, I'm just sort of, um, I'm not laughing, but I'm giggling to myself really. I have no formal training as an artist or illustrator. So it really is, I have to say, to the credit of the digital tools, Photoshop and the Topaz filters that have enabled me to become a digital artist. And really you saw early on in the presentation a, an illustration that was a starting point and I honestly had no idea what I was doing, but I was just playing. And I still try to preserve that play approach to the illustrations, even though I have learned quite a bit about composition and um, you know colors and blending, but I'm learning, still learning as I go. I wish I had more training. You know, it just if you look in this illustration, you see the shadows and placing them in the right place. You know, it, it's tricky and you really do need to know what you're doing, but even if you don't, try it because if I can do it, anybody can do it. It just takes a lot of patience and practice and you'll get there. Thank you. We have uh, quite a few people asking where you got the extra elements that are in this illustration that weren't in the other one that we went over today. So, for example, the butterflies, the bird, the sign, that type of stuff. Okay. Uh, the sign is, uh, uh, that's a great question, by the way. These are all wonderful questions. Uh, uh, the sign and, um, is from a site called Shutterstock where you pay for individual images. So I use Shutterstock.com quite a bit and that allows you to use any of their images for this type of illustration. The same with the bird and let me see what else, the palm tree and Anything that I can find on my own, like these plantains or a pot or a flower, I will take a photograph of it myself. This uh, outline of the sun is from a digital scrapbooking kit. I think I mentioned earlier. I purchased it online with a license or permission to use it in my illustrations. Uh, the writing on the sign is created by me using the Photoshop text tool so that um, <laughs> that doesn't really belong to anyone <laughs> and then <laughs> I created the um, these worms in the background uh, using some some brushes in Photoshop so I try to use as many real things as possible and again it's that blending of the real and the in-between real that creates the surreal. And still looking for a name for this technique because it's so new, at least in children's literature, uh, that um, I'd love to find a great name that defines it. Uh, right now I'm calling it illusion or uh, photo collage, something like that. All right, I have a couple more questions here for you. We have a ton coming in, but I think we can only get to about three more in the next five minutes or so. But um, mm -hmm. let's see here. We have several people asking about if you ever use other Topaz programs, such as Topaz Clean or Simplify, um, which is kind of our more artistic, illustrative mm -hmm. type of um, program. Yeah, actually, uh, I use a lot Topaz Detail. I often use Topaz Detail on the characters in the story because um, although I didn't demonstrate it today, the, the effect that's created in 
Topaz detail is wonderful. It takes a little bit more manipulation than what I did today. So I thought it would take a little bit too much time to illustrate that. But yes, um, Topaz detail, Topaz simplify is one that I use often, often. Um, as much as the full range of the filters as possible, because when I'm in play mode, and I'm just trying to create an effect, and I don't have any idea where I'm going to end up, and I'll use all of the filters that are available from Topaz and see you know, what I like and what I don't like. And that's obviously where a lot of the subjectivity comes in. So you know, I yeah. can go back and um, you know, apply filters again to the can of worms or to the coconuts over on the right, and then all kinds of things. So it's never really finished. And that's part of the fun of all of this. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we have some people asking about the template that you are using and also about the, um, I think it was Deb who asked what was used to create the texture uh, for the the page as well. I think she's noticing the worms and then that texture uh, as well. Ah, yes. Okay. That's, that's a great question. Well, um, the texture, okay, I think if we have this still open in Bridge, which we do, uh, let me, okay, that's not, sorry, Photoshop, that's where I want to be. Uh, this is not the layered file. So let me go back and if I can quickly demonstrate this. Um, I'm going to, in Bridge, slide on up to, Oh, that's a JPEG. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Show you. Okay. Um, might be in here if you don't mind. I'll just open it up quickly. These are some. Okay, let's open this one real fast, and I'll show you how I apply the texture because that's an important feature that I didn't really get to, but I was hoping to. And so it's one of the finishing touches that makes a difference. Now, in this um, photograph, you saw the worms in the background of the sign in the other illustration. And I, I want to apply that kind of texture to this border. So I'm going to find this layer. I'm going to right click. And it's going to take me to the layout guide copy, which is where I want to be. This is the one that we used uh, to apply the hue and saturation. So what I'm going to do is double click on this layer and bring up the layer style menu and choose pattern overlay. And I have quite a few patterns in my panel, as you can see. And what these allow me to do is apply different textures to the background. So the default is this one for some reason that doesn't make any sense, uh, but it happens to be the top of the list. So um, if I want to, let's say, use a kind of gritty appearance that I gave to the illustration, so I could choose these, and each of these is named, and that, of course, is way too intense. So I'm going to bring the opacity down. Um, but can you see the texture that's been created? Yes. Um, what I had done was uh, I, I used the Photoshop technique of creating a pattern which I did with the background of the sign in the other illustration. And I used that pattern as the texture to place on top of the grainy layer. Does that make sense? So again, it, it's a question of choosing different types of grains. Um, as you can see here in my menu, it actually tells you what these mm, 
these are stucco and weave and <laughs> these are all free that I've picked up on uh, again sites like brush easy is one of them uh, I could apply this type of filter um, I don't particularly like it there but uh, again it gives you an idea and you can play forever yeah. with <laughs> <laughs> these types of, of textures. So I hope that answers that question. All right, it okay. does very much. So I am going to just let you know that we've had some awesome feedback and I'm going to go ahead and take it back from you and just say thank you. You've shown people some really interesting things that we've never had here at Topaz before and I think people have really enjoyed seeing the imagination come to life. <laughs> So thank you again, Joanne, for uh, joining us here today. We have tons of great feedback, and I'm definitely going to take you up on another webinar. <laughs> Wonderful. I'll look forward to it. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, and have a great afternoon or morning or wherever you are. I know we have people <laughs> from Australia, and it's 7 a.m. and East Coast where it's the afternoon. So have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.